You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today we're going back to the tidal Potomac River with Captain Chris Johnson of KJ's Outdoor Adventures. Uh, fan favorite. I really wanted to get him back on because we are hitting the slog on the river or it, this sucker is going to be used harder than a rented mule. Uh, give you some context here with what's going on. We got on the June 7th through Friday, June 9th, we have the Bass Nation, the Northeast Division. Then on Saturday, June 10th, we have the TBF Bass Federation. I think there's also... Uh, just before we got talking here, there's also a team Potomac teams event going on. Then the week after that, we have the tackle warehouse invitational tour, which is Saturday, June 17th through Monday, June 19th. Dude, this river's going to get hit like crazy. Yeah. She's going to get pounded. Um, you know, one of the things, um, before we start recording, we start talking about, um, th this river has, has gotten away of just being able to to bounce and even before some of the other tournaments where we used to have um dave fontroy used to have lapr's on saturday and then he had a sunday series and i think there was like a big fish series with lapr that dave fontroy was doing and you know this, and we still had uh Terry Owens, um, great angler. He used to have the Woolworth Outdoors on Thursdays. There's, there was still Wednesday nighters going on, which you know Dan Aquad is still having the Wednesday nighters over there with you know Mike Nels and Lenny Beard and stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, this river was used to getting pounded, and, you know, and it's an interesting thing going forward. And we'll talk about it. I think a lot of these areas they're hot, then they turn off, and then another area will get hot. It's, it's almost like playing musical chairs on some of these areas and a lot of these areas on the river. Um, they're, they're more or less out in you know, community holes, you know, but there's not a lot of secrets on the river anymore. And we'll get more into that as we go on, but, but definitely, yeah, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of tournaments going on. It's like, you know, pick your day. If you want to go, just have, go out and have fun with your kids and family and stuff. You know, the calendar says June, but the, Water temperatures have been weird. I saw uh, Billy Coles posted something on his Instagram. He's at Smith Mountain Lake. And at one point he was seeing 62 degree water. And he's like, what the hell is going on? This is crazy. It's been so wonky, the weather. Has this affected the fish generally compared to years past? Oh, I think it has definitely. Um, there was a trip that I had, I believe, two to three weeks ago. And I remember seeing like 75 degree water. I mean, we're just hammering them. And the, the trip that I had after this front, I mean, it was a pretty good little cool front. And I mean, you wouldn't, I mean, you would have swore there wasn't a fish in Quantico Crew Creek at all. And, you know, it definitely affected them. So um, I think it affects a lot of these fish more in the shallow waters where you don't have a defined uh, channel. You know, Quantico doesn't really have a defined channel. If they're moving in the spawn, and they're back by the telephone, I mean, excuse me, electric lines. I mean, are they going to pull all the way back by the bridge or to the mouth of the Quantico? I don't think so. I think they're more or less kind of burying the grass and, and they just they get kind of dormant until things kind of settle back down. I don't think they'll pull all the way back out. Um, when you have deeper creeks like Matawoman, like, uh, you know, Aqua, you know, Aquaquan, where they can kind of move on these shallow banks and then they can move. Uh, back in the deeper water until they feel more comfortable. And it's not even too much water temperature. I think they can feel this stuff in their swim bladders also. Just imagine, you know, for example, you know, I got to pull out the example. So, you know, this swim bladder is just like this water bottle. So you get a high pressure. Excuse me. You get a little high pressure. And what it does, that high pressure puts pressure on their swim bladder. And if you had something like pushing on the inside of you, you know, it's all about hydraulics. So I think what happens is they kind of just get in that funk. They move down deeper where they feel more comfortable. And until that pressure kind of relieves, and then they move back up, you know, uh, in more shallow water where they feel more comfortable. So, yeah, uh, those shallow areas, you know, uh, Belmont Bay, I mean, we'll get into Belmont too, but a lot of those areas are affected more 
than than others. But yeah, these cold fronts and stuff, yeah, it's been it's been weird. I mean, even in the salt water, it's been weird as far as affecting uh, migrations and uh, the salt water um, fish coming up. It's definitely did a big big thing. Definitely did a big thing. Yeah. Usually a couple, let's say three weeks, three weeks in the past, let's say about mid-May, usually on the Potomac, you're talking, you know, heavy spawning patterns, things of that ilk, moving into June, where you get more of the dog day summer mm -hmm. patterns kind of coming to fruition. And this kind of leads into, we have the Tackle Warehouse Invitational. That's probably the big dog tour that's going to be happening here in the next couple of yeah. weeks. Do, do you think all the spawning will be done and these professionals are going to have to look towards classic summer Potomac patterns? or because of the water temperatures, because of things that are going on, there will still be some stragglers in the spawning bays. <clears throat> well, in my opinion, I think there's going to be still some stragglers going on. Um, you know, I'm seeing, I've am i been all around the river. I've been to Potomac and Aquai Creek, and there are some grass beds there. I mean, guys are already starting to catch them good on the frog. Um, there'll probably be a few spawners laying around in there. Um, you know, look for those holes in the grass. I mean, there I think you can be a little bit more visual. Um, you start going up the river where there's not as much grass, you know what I mean? It's a little more difficult. But um, usually by this time of the year, I'm seeing a lot of grass in Belmont Bay. I'm seeing a lot of grass in, in Chickamauga. I'm seeing a lot of grass in Piscataway. Those areas, you know, I think you were talking about in a show before where you would see them spawn down the river or choir. Uh, Potomac Creek, Arkendale Flats. Arkendale Flats was a was a old school. Mm -hmm. That was the spot back in the day, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then would kind of move into that midsection. And really, Thomas, by May going into June, man, it's like you better be up near Bell Haven and Piscataway Creek, Doug, and those places. But man, it's weird because I'm starting to really kind of see the slowly progress. I mean, real slow. I mean, I'm thinking we may see some spawning fish more farther up north and for scattered away in those areas, because I haven't heard a whole lot, but we're, we're hearing a lot of fish being caught, and I call it the mid-section of the river, you know, near uh, Belmont Bay or Aquaquan, uh, Mad Woman Creek, you know, there's still some good fish in Chickamauga. Um, uh, Greenway Flash is another one. So I, I think I think by that time that tournament comes up, we may see some good fish come out of Piscataway. I think the midsection is going to be still good um, as far as those post spawn fish. And we're going to see a lot of post spawn fish, I believe, coming out of Aquai and Potomac Creek. And especially, you know, we're going to see somebody throwing that frog. I tell you, I don't know if, if, uh, if uh, David Williams is going to be fishing that thing, but I tell you what, if he was, I, I tell you, I'd have my money on David Williams and that frog, I can tell you. He's a good, great fisherman. It, it's interesting because the last time that they were here, um, I believe it was one out of Potomac Creek by the, mm -hmm. Mr., the Italian man, uh, which is yeah. pretty crazy because Potomac Creek hasn't played on that big of a scale. Um, and I guess the last time a big tournament like that was one down there is probably Skeet Reese in 08 mm -hmm. out of Nanjamoin. But that's a blast from the past because the last yeah. time Bass Beach was here, it was up north in D.C., I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, um, the guy from uh, Italy, I think Jalalo, Jalalo, I think his name. Well, I know yeah, I probably yeah, butchered Gelati, his name. Gelato or something. Yeah, yeah I'm not not going to say gelato. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah. yeah so and, and that term was a little bit later in the year when it was on a full a full summer pattern, and he had that yeah. to himself. And I don't think something like that's going to play again. I and I think 100 percent you're right. There's going to be some spawning deal, and it's probably going to be it's probably going to be dealt in the middle and, and something else that's interesting to me that I, I think is fascinating here is the tackle warehouse tour. They're starting on a Saturday and wrapping around to a Monday. So that is going to be a ton of boat pressure. Do you think oh, for yeah. that tournament trail that's going to affect the weights at all when you're starting on a Saturday versus a Thursday, which is typical? Well, I think one of the things, uh, with the larger trails, you know, um, a, a lot of the locals um, ha have a little, little more respect for those guys. Um, I'm just saying, if I see, if I see a local guy and he's fishing to invitationals, and I'm out here with my clients, 
you know, I'm going to talk to them. Hey, you need me back off, you know, because I know they're trying to make it to the next level. You know, at the same time, you know, I can put my claws on some good fish in, in those areas. But I realize that some of these guys, man, travel thousands of miles away to fulfill their dreams. And I think we all, as semi-pro or we're trying to get to the next level of amateurs, I think we, we all kind of re, have a level of respect um, for those larger larger trails. And and a lot, of, a lot of us, you know, we'll go out there and we want to watch what these guys are doing because a lot of us can learn. Um, you know, the same thing happens on the you know, Bass Pro Tours or all around the country. Um, I don't think nobody's going to go out there and try to beat up those fish. I think a lot of guys are going to kind of watch and observe. You know, you get some guy from, you know, Georgia, and he comes through the Potomac River. It's like, wow, I never thought about throwing that, or I never thought about fishing that area. You know, and it gives you a different school of thought. So, um, I think it's one of these things that we have respect for those anglers uh, that come and fish our river and, and support our hotels and our local economy and stuff like that. So um, we, at least we'll, that's what we hope. That's what we hope for. Um, but yeah, some of the local trails, you know what I mean? I mean, it's going to make somewhat of a difference, but um, one thing I do know for a fact, you know, those guys fish for three days and there's a hot area. I mean, it, they cleaned it out. I mean, me and my partner last year, we were in Quantico and, and we had good bag and everything. And we tried to go back two weeks after the, the, uh, it wasn't the invitation. It was, the, you know, uh, tackle warehouse. Uh, uh, I guess it was the Toyota series or whatever. Her? And oh, we went Toyota. back and it was, yeah, it was like, we went back and it was like, wow. I mean, we couldn't find the fish in that place, but then there was like 40 boats in there for like, three days so yeah it, it definitely uh does it uh, makes a difference it definitely makes a difference and is it going to make a difference for those guys with you know the tbf and the Potomac teams and all that i mean it could but you know i think a lot of those guys are used to fishing those high pressure uh lakes and they just know how to adapt man they just know how to adapt and that's that's I mean, man, that's that's big time part of fishing, just knowing how to adapt. And that's why these guys are at the level that they're fishing. They just know how to adapt. You know, so it's gonna be interesting. Definitely gonna be interesting. What do you think it'll take for the ta for invitationals? Let's say it's three days. What do you think you need to average to cash a check? To cash a check, um, I, I I'm really believing, man, 13, 14 pounds to cash a check. Um, and if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, BFLs, I think they got a 20% payout. So you basically go on for about a hold for every five. I think, I think, don't quote me. Um, I have to look in their rules. I think it's a spot for every four. I know the uh, Toyota series is a spot for every four. So, uh, you know, I mean, and, and, but at the same time, you got some high level guys are fishing this thing. Um, so I, I'm thinking probably 13, you know, 13 and a half pounds a day to get a check to win. <laughs> That's a tough one. I mean, it depends. We got this little cool front for the next few days. It could kind of slow some stuff up. If I had to guess, man, if I had to guess, I'm talking about three days on average. I'm going to say you're going to have probably have about 53 pounds over three days. I'd say about 53 pounds. I'd say about think 53. How many 20 pound bags get cracked during the event? Do you think it's under or over 10 or under or over five? I think, I think, I think it's going to be under 10. Um, it, it, it could be right at five. I'm thinking, man, because it, they also, there are some areas on that river. I believe you can still get 20. I had a great day on the river, uh, last Friday, and I, I believe I could have caught 20 off this one spot. And I mean, my client, I mean, by himself, probably would have had about every bit of 17. And he was fishing, you know, kind of just his fish by himself. But at the same time, we're talking three weeks from now. So a lot of dudes, fat spawners, I mean, they could be done. Um, we caught one of the, we, we caught one of the good five times. And I mean, she was done, but she was just engorged. I mean, you I mean, she, she, I mean, she was a, just gorging herself with shared young of the year, or whatever. So, you know, it, it's it's going to be interesting, man. I mean, I think you're going to have some guys looking for spawning fish, and then you're going to have some guys that got these post spawners, 
but they're going to be like in gorgeous, just, just tearing up shad like crazy. But yeah, there's going to be a lot of fish times that are going to weigh probably like 214. They're going to have a head of a full pounder and they're going to come in at like 214 or something, something crazy, you know, because that re whole recovery um, deal that's going to happen on the river at that time. And it's a shame because I, I've talked about this on the show where uh, mm -hmm. the BFL that happened on Smith Mountain Lake, mm -hmm. it happened at the perfect time to show off Smith to be like, this is what Smith can oh, yeah. do. And it's a shame when they do these bigger tournaments that like, I, I do want the Potomac to show out to an extent to take pride in it. And I hate that it's kind of setting up to where it's not going to be at the best in one sense. And I guess they just do what they do. But if you could put this tournament at a time, when would you put it to really show off the river? Oh man, I mean, I, you know, it, it's. I think the numbers you may not get in in late March, early April, but around that mid April time frame, I'm gonna tell you something. I mean, you can catch a lot of pigs, man. I mean, I'm talking about some straight sows, man. And you know, I posted up earlier this year. I think it was, I believe, it was late March. I think it was like late March, and I was in a creek, man, fishing a chatterbait. You know, casting about five feet of water. I was dropping it down past the wood because it wasn't a whole lot of grass at that time. So I'm dropping that thing by some wood, and it's like boom, like here's like a four pound, boom, it's like three and a half. You know, so here's a four and a half. So it's like, man, you know, if they if they went sort of earlier, you know, around that late late March, April, mid April time frame, yeah, we might not see the numbers, the sheer numbers, but. God, I'm telling you, man, there are some sows on this river. And going back from what was it, six, seven years ago, man, when everybody declared the river was dead, and I mean, a big fish was like a full pounder. So, I mean, man, this river's coming back, and I, okay. I don't know the answer. I, I really can't tell anybody. Somebody asked, "Hey, what happened in those years?" Man, I don't have an answer. Nobody has an answer. I, the only thing that I can come up with, I think me and Captain Steve talked about it. Those years, there was extensive, extensive match of hydrilla everywhere. And I think what happened, a lot of those big fish that felt the pressure, they got into that thick hydrilla match, and they were just hard to find. A lot of times in hydrilla, you don't have points. You don't, don't have these big, like, codes and they're easy to find easy to target they're just straight match for for half a mile a mile it's like how do you fish that you know it's not like you raise your mill full you see points in the grass you see holes in the grass this stuff man was just matted up and i remember i never forget this i was fishing an aba tournament and this was i guess back in 06 07 cold front came through we were in chicken muscle and, and there's a bunch of just hydrilla and I just happened to look down, and the only thing I could see was his dorsal fin and two little beady eyes sitting right there. He's a good three pounds, just sitting right in that high drill. And I really think that year, that's what happened, because there was so much of that high drill. I mean, the frog bite wasn't doing well. I mean, nobody was catching big fish. But then all of a sudden, they started coming back. Where did they go? <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, nobody has an answer. I don't even know. I really don't. Um, that's the, that's the closest thing I can come up with, but I think they just had so much cover and it was so hard to find them. We were just basically getting the crumbs of the biomass of the Potomac River. Now it's and it was, this is what's interesting too. This is what's interesting. We're not seeing those big masses of grass and chick marks, and that's kind of going to the report. I don't want to jump. To a head, but we're seeing these areas like Chicken Monkson, uh, Greenway Flats, Belmont Bay. Some of these areas you had tons and tons of grass, good grass. Now it's not there, or there's smaller areas of grass. And what I think happens is it, it compounds them in these little areas. But then when you have 150 boats trying to hit these areas, is it going to make it do, you know, is it going to be a factor? I think it will be. I think it will be. 
And just to, to that point, it, you seeing this, so I, guys, I also, I try to do as much research for the show as possible. And some notes and nuggets I take is from Lake Chickamauxon, where they're having a huge issue with, they've sprayed so much grass that you're seeing some fish kills. They don't know what that's because of. And, you know, what made that lake so good besides the, the F1, the Florida strain program was that it had an abundance mm -hmm. of aquatic vegetation. And yep. when you, when you kill off all that vegetation, chick had chick monks had these massive bags that happened. And I think mm -hmm. one part of that was you got rid of a lot of that cover. And now all this fish, like, like you said, to support what you said, a lot of fish fighting over a very small area to live. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know, like when, when we, we had you guys on last time, we talked about how the Northern part uh, up near DC, how that used to just be carpet back in the day, carpet of grass. Yeah. 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 And now there's nothing. And it's, it's almost scary though, that like, yeah, the fishing is getting better, but at what cost, if the grass keeps leaving, like it is, it's, it's, it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you know, it's hard to say what's going on. We got so many factors, um, you know, being, uh, me being in the landscape, um, industry for many, many years. I mean, you have nutrient, you know, overload, uh, a lack of nutrient, um, you know, of course we had, uh, you know, salt runoff. You know, we go through the winters, and there's so much salt runoff. You know, the you know stuff goes untreated, goes straight in the water. Do we really know how that affects the grass? We don't know. Um, you know, we got the bow fishing. I mean, bow fishing is taking off like like through the atmosphere right now. That's something so, else. I mean, that's something else. But could it be good? You know, because that I mean they're going through with trolling mode, just like a bass boat, but they're doing it all night back forth, back forth, you know, in a in a big motor. You know, you would think it kind of help um propagate a lot of that, but I don't know if we really understand what's going on in this river, you know, because Belmont Bay is a perfect example. There was tons from Conrad Island almost to I think it's Canes or Massey Creek or whatever. I think it's Canes. And there was tons of grass. Now you go there. Last time, a few times I'm there, I'm, I'm side scanning, like looking for it, and I can't find it. There's small little areas now um, that you find the grass, but a lot of that grass tip was part of the community hole. I think where Scott Martin one years back. This stuff ain't. It's it's not there anymore. So it. I think it. I, I think that's another thing, Tom. Too looking at that warehouse areas that's going to become a, that imitation. Uh, I think a lot of those guys had fish in Potomac before and they're used to these areas. They're going to come here and they're going to be a little surprised. Like, ooh. They're yeah. looking at their marks and like, they grass in here. It's going to be different. And it's really going to sandwich them up. And I think it's going to also go down mm -hmm. to people are probably going to win on hardcover. Uh, I, mean, I mean, you had a, the quote of the quote last time you were on, which is like a piece of concrete is a piece of concrete. Like it's mm -hmm. there. And so I feel like the guys that have that knowledge of the hardcover stuff to supplement maybe a little bit of a grass bite, that's what's probably going to play. Yeah, and I, and those guys, I think even on a local level, you know, some of these guys have been fishing the river 30 years, 40 years. They remember there wasn't a whole lot of grass, you know, in the southern regions. Most of the grass was right underneath the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. I think those guys are, are already used to it. And I mean, I'm not trying to throw a crowd favor out dick, you know, but I think Thomas Wooten, I mean, he's a great fisherman. Uh, he knows Smith Mountain. He knows the river. He, I mean, he knows uh, uh, the Chickahominy. Uh, I think he's going to be a crowd favorite. I mean, I'm kind of pulling for him. He's a great fisherman, very knowledgeable. He's been around a long time. I think he's going to be one of those guys, if he can't find him on grass, he's going to be able to find him on hard cover. And that's what he did on the Chicken Harmony. Everyone was pounding grass down in the southern regions. Um, you know, I, from what I understand, he went up north and he was dock fishing and, and he knew he knew how to find them. So, um, yeah, I mean, the river can be won without fishing grass. But I think uh, for the masses, a lot of guys have been so used to fishing grass, 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 grass. Those that can go up near the harbor, uh, near the spoils, uh, Bell Haven, I think those guys, man, they're going to be really, really rewarded, and they may have it to themselves. You mentioned that really in that that 08, 07 time frame is when the grass mm -hmm. was at its peak, and it's 2023, so we're talking 15 years. Yeah. Has it been 15 years that the grass has steadily gotten worse, or has there been up? Has it been up and down? 
Um, I, I, I think it's been up and down, but I think it's been more extremes. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, everybody probably knows that fish in that time frame, um, uh, right around the Mount Vernon, uh, Spirit of Mount Vernon, that area there, all the way up to Little Hunting Creek was full of grass, man. That was one of my favorite grass beds to fish. And it, it was like from the shoreline to halfway out in the river. You know, this, it was immense. I mean, you could throw a spinnerbait, you could throw a frog, you could throw a senko, uh, you know, square bill on certain areas. I mean, and now to see it, like, gone and for years, you know, where you would expect maybe a little less or a little more acreage as all these areas. I mean, this is just completely gone. So, and I struggle with that. It's like, man, is the government spraying this stuff? Or, I mean, what's going on? Yeah. And, I mean, I really wonder about that, Tom, because, I mean, I understand little small areas where maybe you had, I'm just saying, you know, theoretically 500 acres. Now, all of a sudden, you maybe have, like, you know, 40 acres or none at all. And I'd never think I'd see Belmont Bay like this whole bay, like with no grass. I mean, I was confused. I'm like, okay, am I here early? But now we're getting into June. It's like, where is it? You know, so. Well, this gets back to the other thing uh, that has been stirring the internet. Uh, there was a BFL mm -hmm. that happened. And basically 24 hours after that went down, I my phone goes melting with people calling me <laughs> and and telling me about a certain incident that happened, which is, you know, mm -hmm. you know, uh, allegedly, I'll always say that until we get yeah, proven by the yeah, authorities. Yeah. Allegedly, there was commercial fishing in an area they weren't supposed to be. Um, you know, Steve and you also, I talked to both of you guys mm -hmm. about it and how that goes. Is there any possibility that commercial fishing could disturb these aquatic grass beds and you make know an issue? From what I've seen, and this is just what I've seen. And again, you know, the disclaimer out there, allegedly what these guys are doing. And I'm not a commercial fisherman as far as dragon nets and, and hoop nets and all the other gear that are used. But I have a, a, some type of understanding when it comes to, you know, haul saying. And what I seen was a haul saying. A haul saying that has weights in the bottom and it literally like rolls across the bottom from what I understand. Now, is it tearing up the grass? I, I I don't see how it could not. I mean, even when I'm throwing a, if I go out there and throw a crankbait and it gets caught in the grass, yeah, I'm pulling root up grass. But you know, you got a net that's, I'm just saying, you know, 200 yards, 300 yards, and they go in a boat and they go around and make a big old circle and they come back to the bank and you got guys and hip waders that are hauling the same. Uh, just saying that back in and it's dragging on the bottom. I just have a hard time uh, understanding that it's not tearing up the grass. Um, it, it surely has got to be tearing up the grass because a lot of times when you, they're done, you see grass all over the place. I mean, they probably say the same thing about us with our troll motors, but um, there's a lot of bycatch. But you have a good point there about that, whether it is the the bow fisherman or the commercial fisherman. And this mm -hmm. was an issue that, that Alex, uh, who, who ended up winning that BFL, said he believed mm -hmm. it helped. It was Chickamauxin where it happened. Uh, mm -hmm. Allegedly, the fishing happened the night before. Well, that destroys mm -hmm. that grass bed. And in the sense of how long until that area can be fished again successfully. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have a big fishing uh, situation like that happen in Pohick. Well, how long mm -hmm. until you can go into Pohick and fish again? Or how is that is that messed up for a week, a day, a month? Like how long? Yeah, and that, and that's a that's a good point too. Because I didn't th actually I didn't even think about what you just said. You know, all these guys fishing at night. You know, I mean, the gill netters maybe. If <laughs> I'm not sure no hours on that, so I can't speak on that. But then when you have the the uh, the bow fisherman guys out here. And I'm not, I mean, I love y'all guys. I mean, hey, you know, they're enjoying this sport just like I enjoy, yeah. you know, what I do. But um, it doesn't affect the determined anglers. Does it affect the recreational guy to come and fish the grass beds in the morning, seven or six o'clock in the morning? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I guarantee it does. Guarantee it does. I mean, 
they run a, a booth with a generator all day long and flashing the lights and stuff. It, it, it's got to get those fish kind of to a level of anxiety, you know, as far as bass behavior. Um, it is what it is. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure Potomac's not the only place it happens. I'm sure it happens in other areas with the, with the, uh, invasives. Florida it probably happens, I'm sure. But that's a good question. That's a good question for a biologist, you know, for, yes. I mean, that, yeah, I mean, that's a, I think that's a great question. You know, those areas that are being fished as far as bow fishing, how long would, does it take those areas to recuperate? You know, because a lot of those guys, they're off the water, let's say two, three o'clock in the morning. Three hours later, started, yeah. Three hours later, it's like, man, I pre fish here. We killed them Friday, man. What's going on? Well, that boat fisherman that you met, and you wave, hey, bud, you know, they're mm -hmm. on their way to launch out of small at least the They're going back to that same grass bed you practice on. You think you got it locked. You, you're at the ramp, like, man, man, we hope we, if we're boat one, we'll get right on. We'll, we'll get 20 pounds, and you get there. It's like, I don't know what happened, dude. We had the right time, we had everything right. But that boat was boat fishing there for three, four, five, six hours. And then three hours, is that another recovery of your grass bed? So that, and that's another point too. Could it be that these grass beds have more frequency of being highs and lows compared to hard cover? Because a lot of these boat fishermen, they're not going to go to hard cover areas. They're going to go to areas with a whole bunch of grass. Like Potomac, that's a like hell of a point. That's a hell of a yeah. point. So that's that I, I I think the hard cover bait, dude. I think that's going to. I'm telling you, don't don't count out up up toward Piscataway and Bellhaven and those areas near DC. It could happen. It could happen because I'm telling you, I've been out there and there's nowhere near as much acreage of grass. And you put 150 boats out there, it fishes very. It'll start fishing real small. You know, so it's going to be interesting. I'm not, I'm really not for the idea of, of sectioning off pieces of water or putting in, you know, diff different sorts of legislation. But mm -hmm. should you basically say like, listen, no one's allowed in a quiet just to make sure the grass gets up before people tear it up. Like, is this something or Potomac Creek? Hey, listen, you're not allowed to fish that until the grass gets up and mats out to make sure we preserve some of it. Cause I'm thinking not just from the fish, but the ecosystem standpoint, like we need yeah. to make sure we keep some grass beds viable. You know, it Tom's that that's, that is really important to what you just said. I know not even on a, the uh, upper tide of Potomac, we're talking about bass and, you know, bluegill and all those other, uh, species that spawn up um that that that's been very important even with the seagrasses for the speckled trout yep. uh, for the redfish um those fish that frequent the shallows um and, you know we had problems with same thing gillnetters um the same problem happens in mississippi you know uh with the trawlers you know and and the bycatch and destroying the seagrass so it, it's um it, it it's a it's a hard thing to deal with as far as legislatively, you know, because unfortunately, unfortunately, we have a lot of folks that are in legislation that have relationships, deep relationships with these companies. Um, you know, I'm not gonna throw the names out there, you know, because they that's their business. I don't I'm not gonna throw mud, but they're all businesses, you know, in Virginia that are lined up with a lot of these congressmen as far as in our Virginia legislature, um, even probably even in the, on the federal level. And upon my research, this one company, um, the owner of the company uh, is into salmon farm in Canada. Hmm. Well, you know, if I'm raising all these salmon, you know, why am I going to go to I'm I'm just saying throwing it out there. I'm not going to go to Petco to feed my salmon. <laughs> you know? yep. I'll just buy the company up, and I'll catch I'll basically catch my own food for my farm salmon at mm -hmm. any cost. I'll get as much as I want, and I think that's kind of where we are with it. It's it's all about corporate greed, not about 
sustaining the ecosystem. That's fine. With that company, if they want Menhaden to do what they got to do, that is great. That is fine. But we have to be sustainable, man. I mean, that's just going with herring. That's going with shed. That's going with, I mean, they are the building blocks of the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem. And yes, I think we have to do something. I don't know how. I don't know stipulation wise. Uh, we got to do something to protect these seagrasses, you know. Um, but it, yeah, at some point, um, there was a point there was not much grass on the Potomac River, but evidently when you see when the grass is there, it really filtrates that water. I mean, I mean, I was near Greenway Flats the other day, and there was a lot of grass that I could not even see, but that grass, I mean, that grass was just as olive, I mean, like a green olive. I mean, it was beautiful. I ain't gonna lie. I mean, it, on a hot day, man, I, I jump off my boat, man, use my day on cavitation plate to get back on my boat. You know, it, was, it, was, it looked great. I'm gonna be honest with you. And then, you know, there's other areas there was no grass, and it, you know, it looks like I can't say the Rappahannock River because even the Rappahannock is starting to look like beautiful. I mean, Rappahannock River looks great. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, yeah, in short, man, we got to protect these grasses because they're really cleaning and filtering out this water for us, man, and making a great habitat for the young of the year species of of all bass, bluegill, even snakehead. I I want to get and guys in the comment section, maybe you can help me out here. Um, Florida, I think, has laws in the books, especially in the Keys, because I remember when I was a kid and we go down there and fish that you can't just go through the flats and tear it up with your big motor because mm -hmm. you you have to protect the eelgrass beds there because it's such a, an important part of the ecosystem. And maybe that's where it comes is where you can't have people. If you declare that greenway flats is like a grass preserve, you can use your trolling motor, but you can't just, just open up and maybe that'll help with some of these things, but you're right. Something has to be done because you're right. Not just bass. It's the manhaden. It's the redfish. It's the trout. It's the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It's so important. You know, and one thing sorry. I want to pivot to, no, no, you're right. One thing I want to pivot to, though, is you know, with, with with your business, the saltwater side of things, and I think people mm -hmm. forget that we have redfish and speckled trout so close to DC, like within mm -hmm. an eight hours drive or days drive, they can be with you catching redfish and trout. Yeah, it's it's, and it's funny, you know, when I came up on saltwater, you know, I at first the. First level of fishing I did was basically bottom fishing. My dad took me bottom fishing. I'll never forget the first fish I ever caught was a channel cat at, at the, on the banks of a small state park. And I do, I'm telling you, you couldn't tell me anything. And so I was used to more bottom fishing. We would go, you know, near Cobb Island, you know, Cyber Colonial Beach area, Ragged Point. And, you know, we bottom fish. We catch, you know, spot and perch and, you know, Kroger's and all different types of species. Uh, then I started getting into bass fishing where you throw more lures and, and I was like, okay, this is, this is kind of cool. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm not just sitting there just holding pole waiting for, waiting for the bite. You know, you can actually cast to them and make them bite. I'm like, all right, I, I kind of like this. So when I got into the shallow water fishing for, for stripers, then I was like, oh, okay. So I can use these same techniques, swim baits, you know, uh, chatter baits, believe it or not, uh, spinners, like inline spinners, even spinner baits, uh, top water. And I can put this into the salt. And it was funny. My brother was hot as crap. And he's out there throwing a buzz bait. I'm like, dude, what the heck are you going to do with that? I mean, we were like 15, 17 years old, something like that. And he gets a blow up on us. Like, what the heck was that? He did it again, and he ended up getting like an eighteen-inch, you know, rockfish. I was like, "Oh man, that's cool!" So we found this little area; it was a little shoal, and I know I had one of those old-school renegade poppers, like you get out of Walmart. It looked like it had that little; it was about this long. It had the little honeycomb, little octagon, yeah. little things on it, little renegade top water. And I slung that thing out there, man. I caught one like twenty-four inches. You know, I was like, "Oh man." And dude, that was, that was it. That was it. I mean, I was hooked. And I mean, I don't know. My God, this was like late nineties or something like that. Because remember, I mean, that was all part of Walmart when they had the Renegade series and stuff. And then they got out of fishing. 
Um, but I started like fine tuning, fine tuning, uh, you know, striper fishing using topwater lures. And I mean, this is over, I got over 20 some years of experience doing it. And every so often you get a red fish or you get a speckled trout. Um, last year I had clients and mess around, had a little beetle spin. We're trying to catch white perch. You know, we're using like six pound line. And I'm teaching them, hey, you don't have to use live bait and 14, 18, $20 blood worms. You can go out here with little beetle spins and go around this shore, these shorelines and docks and haul cover. And you can catch some, you know, bigger size ones. So, wow. you know, it, it, it's, it's real cool. I mean, bass fishing taught me a lot as far as uh, getting, being a better saltwater fisherman, understanding tides. And then I started kind of messing around near the lower bay. People were like, man, you take a your bass boat down there, like Reedville, you take that out by like Irvington. I was like, yeah, you know, so like you got to pick your days. Um, understand your tides. Always look at your forecast. Even when you're out there, look at your forecast. Look at your wind direction on an hourly basis because, you know, you might be good in that three to five range, but then, like, around 12, the tide turns around and you get a 10-mile-an-hour wind that's going against each other. That's not – that's not – that's no bueno. So, that's no bueno. But, <laughs> so, but um, I started seeing grass in these areas. Um, I'm not good with all my marine grasses yet, but I started seeing grass. I was like, oh, okay. And I took what I knew from being around my dad in Mississippi and Biloxi and the way they fish for redfish. I, I didn't know. I had no clue at all. So I go down to Biloxi, Mississippi, and they use voodoo shrimp. They use DOA lures. They use oh, popping yeah. corks. And man, I, let me tell you, y'all that are listening to this podcast, I'm gonna tell you something. I, I don't know, Thomas. We gonna have to go out there. We're gonna do go do a live or something. Yeah, man, the popping cork is no joke. It's probably one of my favorite ways to fish for them. And it's it's oh man, it's like one of my favorite ways to fish. You can use literally almost anything on the bottom of that cord. Put your little leader to you know 24 inches, 18 inches, even down to 36 inches. As long as you can cast it out there, 24 is good. And man, dude, I'm just casting around this seagrass. Just just pop, 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 let it sit. Pop, pop, let it sit. And dude, I mean, I was doing the same thing I was doing in Biloxi. I was doing it in Reedville. I was doing it in, in Kilmarnock and in, in Irvington. And everywhere you had shows, and it's like everything that I learned from bass fishing as far as structure, talking about like drop-offs, even if it's two or three feet, um, seagrass, docks, those type of hard cover areas, buoys that have rock piles around them. Bass fishing, man, taught me how to be a better saltwater angler. I'm telling you, there's guys that are listening to this podcast right now that I believe they, they can go to these same areas, use the same techniques they use. Man, dude, Thomas, I was using a drop shot down there, man. I was yeah. using a drop shot robo worm, and I was catching white trout down there. It is it, it's phenomenal. But one of the products, and I'm not even pushing a whole lot of product on the show, but one of the products that I fell in love with this stuff right here, this procure huh. stuff. Of course, this is like trophy bass. Oh, but wow. you can get you can get this stuff in shrimp, you can get it in blue crab, you can get it in shad, cocoa. I mean, they got all type because of this procure, man. And I I put that stuff on all my plastics when I'm fishing down south in uh in Reedville on that popping cork, you know, the little deal way lures or whatever you want to use. I like those light jig heads or quarter ounce. You know, no more than like three eighths, because you want it to kind of pin them down. You're popping it, it's kind of doing one of these motions, just mm -hmm. kind of falling through. And oh man, I, you can tell I'm getting excited because I, I love that style of fishing, man. And and it, and it's still great. You can still use your top water stuff too. I mean, um, there was one guy on YouTube. I forget his handle now. And this is no joke, man. He was using like a Texas rig uh, crawl. And was catching redfish, like standard, regular Texas red crawls. And I guess to them, they just think it's like a crab or something. And he was crushing them. So it, it's it, if you're a great bass fisherman, man, you can go, you can go down Biloxi and Louisiana, those areas, South Carolina, South Carolina. 
got great bass. Oh, excuse me, uh, channel bass, I should say, redfish. Um, and you can use those those same same techniques. There's one guy, man, that's on 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 my page. I think his last name is Thomas. Everybody calls him John Q. And he's a great fisherman, man. He's you know black guy, captain down that way. And man, I'm telling you, he's he is awesome. But what I'm saying is short pass, like everything I learned bass fishing, you can use those same techniques in, in salt water. And it's and it's super fun. I mean, it's super fun. And the fishing, it's like Thomas is just so much better from years ago. And I think because the federal government, I think they got um, the three mile law, you can't catch in. It's protected after three miles. And I think it's done wonders. And of course, we got the eyesore from, was it last year? We had yeah. the net break and the, the, the spill. And there was like, what, there was like tons of redfish that were breeders that were kind of. Uh, I think that you're mentioning something that we need to hype up more. As you mentioned, Louisiana, classic redfish and speckled trout. Mm -hmm. South Carolina, classic redfish, speckled trout. The Keys, of course, especially in the Everglades. But the Chesapeake Bay, is there's something special happening where you are now starting to see that happen in the bay, which is freaking cool. Because yeah. unlike striped bass, generally speaking, trout and redfish set up just like bass fishing 101, just like freshwater bass oh, yeah. fishing. Absolutely. And... You know, one of the areas that I, I frequent, man, is just it's just a point that got some grass on it. You know, we're talking that three to five foot range, which is perfect for a popping cork. Uh, you know, standard just casting uh, you know, swim baits, things of that nature. And I I just me, I I don't know. I'm a grass freak. If I got grass around that point as well, man, that's just I got I gotta go stale cracker on you, man. That's that's money, dude. I mean, you know. <laughs> And, but that's what that's the type of things I'm looking for, and I, and man, to educate these guys, you know, I know there's a lot of guys who never caught a redfish or never caught a speckled trout in the Chesapeake Bay uh, system, or even the Potomac, Lower Potomac, Lower Rappahannock. Basic biggest advice I can give guys: go to Google Earth. Go to Google Earth. Go to those rivers that you see everybody talking about. Um, on Facebook or on Instagram, you know, Cortona, Pianca Tank, Gwen's Island, those areas uh, like that near Reedville, um, near Smith Point, and go to your Google. Look for those areas. You'll see the grass, just like you see it on the Potomac River. You'll see that same grass, uh, you know, and, and near those areas. Now, what I look for is something like a point i go back to my Navionics. Now I know where the grass is. Look for those deeper areas um, where there's some type of transition, especially this time of year. Um, they might not be necessarily shallow, shallow, um, but I think a few of them are definitely moving to shallow. I think there was one guy that posted it on Facebook. He got a 31-inch redfish in like two feet of water, like, you know, yeah. on holiday weekend. <laughs> so, you, you know, biggest thing is look for those areas where you see the grass, and look for the same things as you look for bass fishing. Look for points. Maybe a, a row of docks that's got deep water nearby and throw that dag on popping cork right near those deep docks. So, you know, if you understand bass fishing and what to look for, you can definitely be uh, just as successful uh, on these red fish and speckled trout. And I tell you what, I mean, they fight hard. I, I love, I love some speckled trout and rockfish. I mean, uh, redfish, man. And, Honestly, you, you may get a chance to get in a, a straight bass too. So we have, I mean, you know, the show is fishing the DMV, man. And I'm telling you, we got some great fishers yeah. in the DMV area. I mean, yeah. the lakes, the ponds, all, all lower rivers, tidal systems. And, you know, Tom, you know, I, I probably haven't said it, but I'm going to say it in the show, man. I appreciate everything you're doing, man, exposing these areas, man, and, and helping guys be become better anglers, man. You know, this platform is great for that. I appreciate that, man. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. And hopefully we can bring some light on onto the fisheries and we can also show light onto the things that we want to make better and we can yeah, bring sir. our voice to the table. Um, I was I was honored that when the commercial fishing thing happened, I had so many people reach out to me like mm -hmm. I had like I could do something about it. And but hopefully one day our voices can come together and we can make changes for the better for, for these fisheries. Um, if people want a book 
a saltwater trip with you. When is the best time for them to book for you? Uh, like, what would that process be? So, you know, a lot of folks, they'll DM me on Facebook. Um, I got uh, my number on there. And I also have my website, you know, kjsoutdooradventures.com. You know, my number's on, uh, I think my number's on my Facebook page, too. I got, like, a little picture of my business card and stuff. So, you know, I was just in Bass Pro Shops, and I visited Green Top Sporting Goods today. So they've got my business cards in there, too. So, um, and Kimmy Ann's Bait and Tackle on Colonial Beach. You know, my friend Wes Jones over there. You all you all need a thing, and you're in the – from the beach area, definitely give him a holler. I think he's doing a, uh, uh, actually he's doing a striper tournament and a catfish tournament on the 17th of June. So I know there's been a lot of interest from guys in the Fredericksburg area and King George that want to try it out. I mean, it's cool. I mean, because we, we, we really don't have a lot of striper tournaments like that. Um, and, and catfish too. And I mean, the blue cats, I mean, that's, Man, I mean, we've had shows talking about the blue cats, and it's That's a hot topic. Hey, I ain't gonna lie to you. I I'm not gonna lie to you, Tones. I got. I mean, I go, you know, my clients, and we're trying to target bass, and all of a sudden, you get this dang on fish ready, you know, rip the rod out of your hand when you throw in a chatterbait, and but it's fun. I actually, I actually, I actually enjoy catching them, and even on my website, you know, I don't have per se like catfish trips. But I'm entertaining it. I think I made entertaining it because they actually all fun to catch on lures. They're fun to catch on bait. You know, so there is a niche of people that like them. It's frustrating because like I had Gene Cat Cat Daddy on here who specifically targets them. And, and he's got mm -hmm. a his point is like, you know, if you're a family that's never been fishing before, you can go out and catch something big that's gonna tug hard and you're gonna have a great time. And that's the thing about them is it, they're stupid. And if you get them to eat, they're gonna tug on the end of your line and if if you're an, a novice, that's fun. Oh, that's fun. Uh, and a, a fifty pounder, a forty pounder, Jesus! I mean, that thing's <laughs> gonna lock any equipment. And I don't know. It, I don't. I don't know what to do about it because I just wish someone could come on the show and tell me why it's not an issue on the Mississippi or the New River. The New River flatheads are native, and they mm -hmm. don't kill all the smallmouth. They don't have any issues there. So why is it we can't get like a homeostasis here on the Potomac or the James? Like I. I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, you know, I got a friend of mine that lives in King George, and he was he he, he wouldn't have a fish fry. He's from Louisiana, and they love blue cats. And I was like, oh man, dude, I wish you had told me because we probably released like fifty pounds of catfish <laughs> my last guy trip. <laughs> so, I mean, but it, it's I, I think it's it's get, we're getting there. Um, I got a good friend of mine, Captain Marcus Wilson from uh, Hot Lakes Charters. He's um, been doing a lot of charters uh, for the Blue Cats as of lately, and he's been good. He's been he booked a lot of trips, uh, and, and I know there's been some uh, changes in regulations through the Atlantic States Fisheries Commission as far as for stripers. So next year we're going to see some changes, um, and maybe the Blue Cat can be one of those species that can kind of fill that void until we get, you know, those numbers back up before our breed of stripers, man. That's real important, man. And that's what's so interesting looking at this, just from my perspective and getting to talk to everyone in the industry is like, if the striper are, are more regulated because for whatever reason they have to be, well, what are you going to do? You got snakehead and you got blues mm -hmm. and guess what? Mm -hmm. Both the government doesn't want around for better or worse. But then as a guide, you're going to go from striper to snakes and blues because there's something people want to catch. Yeah, you know, yeah. People want to catch a big snakehead. The dragon community is a cult and they oh. love those things. I mean, and people will pay a shit ton of money to fly in here to be with you to catch a big snakehead or a big blue cat. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's I'll tell you, you know, because you don't catch them all the, all the time. But it's like it's just something mystical about about the snakehead. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things when we first got introduced to our DMV area it was like the name, ooh, snakehead. Like, man, is this thing poisonous? I mean, you go to dive, it bites you. you know? mm -hmm. I mean, man, it'll walk, it'll walk on land. Next thing you know, it could be in the Rappahannock River. It'll walk across, you know, in, in the woods. It's like. You know, it was like this big freak thing going on about the snakehead. And it's like, man, 
actually, you know, it, it hasn't been like terribly bad. It um, really hasn't. You know, just bear with me a second. Let me uh, get my charge. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. And then, yeah. So I, I, I don't want to keep you all night. So where can people find you if they would like to book a guided trip with you? So, again, you know, I'm on the website. You can catch me on the mobile web. You know, Google me. It's uh, KJ's Outdoor Adventures, www.kjsoutdooradventures.com. You can hit my business cards around. I'm in uh, Bass Pro Shops and, and Green Top. Um, you can DM me on Facebook. Um, and you can call me, 804-761-3131. Uh, I'm telling you, you know, it's... Man, we're going into some good times. June, July, I mean, it's like, it's great for snakeheads. It's going to be great for uh, largemouth, and the saltwater game is going to be, it, it's going to be on. And I'm I'm really excited for that, man. Seeing these numbers of, of speckled trout and redfish, uh, man, I mean, and not just the numbers, man, but even the size of these fish, man. I mean, it's just unbelievable, man. Catch a 30-plus inch. You know, redfish are like two feet of water. It's it's it's, it's just insane. But Dude, it's a uh, awesome. yeah, yeah. It's I, I mean, you just don't know, man. I'm itching to go. I, I actually want to go tomorrow. <laughs> you know, but the winds. You know, that's a whole other issue too, man. Cause I was talking to a few captains, and you know, we're having like this. I don't know what's going on. It's like we're having this whole north northeast east wind pattern going on right now. And I think that's why we got this little temporary kind of cool down. It's not too bad, 70, 72 degrees. But, man, I'm looking for 85, 86 degrees, man. That water getting good and hot, man, and top water might be good first thing in the morning. So, I mean, we're headed that way, you know. Yeah. It's like I, I want I want summer like yesterday. Yes, that's, that's that's where I am, man, for sure, for sure. Dude, and, we're uh, going to get there. Yeah, that's for sure. But I got to tell you this too, Thomas. So, Hey, everybody out there listening to this, man, like I said, man, this is a great, great, great show. You know, Thomas has invited me, and but look, you know, it's a great show, and Thomas really cares about the environment, cares about the anglers, and we want everybody to be educated on this show, man. And it's, mm -hmm. and I, I just want to say thank you, Thomas, because I even, I even got a trip, man, through a guy that watched your show, and he wanted to go out with me. And so I just want to tell you personally, man, I appreciate it, man. And he had like an epic day. I put it on Facebook, man. And he had like, oh my God, he got like a five pounder. He got like four, he got three and a half. He was like, man, dude, he's like, this is the best bass fishing trip. And he's a kayak guy. Really? And he was like, he's like, man, dude, I enjoyed myself, man. So um, I just want to tell you personally, man, thank you for everything that you're doing to support local anglers. Thank you for supporting us as far as environmental issues everything that you're doing man so it, it's, it's an awesome show i appreciate everything you do and it, i know it's a lot of work man and and editing and doing all that good stuff but i can tell you you generally have a passion for the outdoors man i appreciate you man no and, and i thank you so much i appreciate that and then thank you guys for so much what you do i, I don't think guides really get the, the credit they deserve. And it really was when I had the Shenandoah Riverkeeper on, he said like how important guides are for information to protect the environment, because mm -hmm. guess what? You're out there probably more than some of the biologists. You're out there every day. You guys know the water, you know what it's like, and you know when something's wrong. And so, you know, make sure like pe people in the bass fishing world sometimes get upset at guides for, for political reasons and all that crap. But Understand that they're the ones that will see issues when they happen. They'll be the first ones to know of a fish kill or when there's commercial fishing that shouldn't be somewhere or if there's or if there's something bad that happens. So just give them a little bit of respect uh, when you see them out on the water. But uh, guys, yeah, th thank yeah. you. So Chris, thank you so much again for coming on the show. Again, link in the episode description to everything we talked about so you can book a trip with, with Chris this summer. Go after some Chesapeake Bay redfish and trout, which is so cool that's a thing now that we actually can talk about uh guys we might be talking a little bit longer but we're done here and we'll see you guys next time on fishing the dmv bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your hosts thomas aarons and jared mounts fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in winchester virginia if that doesn't get you jacked up i don't know what will